Good evening and welcome to the October 6, 2014 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, would you call the roll, please? Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Buffard? Here. Mr. Paul? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. DuPont? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Ms. Auglis? All right, our first item on the agenda this, this evening is the approval of minutes of September 15, 2014. I move to approve. Second. We have a second. Thank you, Mr. Mazur. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? I show that to be unanimous. For the record, um, Mr. McGee is a non-voting member unless somebody recuses himself this evening. Um, <clears throat> our next item this evening, Sagra, uh, excuse me, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chase, I appreciate that. Um, I knew I would do that. I couldn't make the letters any bigger. Uh, this evening, I do want to make an announcement that we have two items on the agenda that have been tabled. Item number five, Foster Farm Subdivision Habitat for Humanity for Greater Portland, has been tabled this evening at the request of the applicant, and so has the Waterhouse Acres Subdivision uh, off Beach Ridge Road. So uh, those two items will be taken up at a later time. Item number four, going back to that, Sawgrass Subdivision, Star Homes, Inc., Request a final subdivision review for a 24-lot subdivision <coughs> of Sawyer Road. Mr. Chase. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As board members may recall, this is an item you've seen a number of times, dating back to a uh, January preliminary approval. And then subsequent to that time, uh, we reviewed it at your last meeting as well, at which time we discussed a number of changes that occurred since the um, preliminary approval uh, primarily among or chief among them are were the uh, adjustments to the stormwater management approach which we addressed uh, at the last meeting quite fully as well as the applicant uh, has taken advantage of the affordable housing density provision within the VR4 zoning so the subdivision is now a 24 lot subdivision instead of 23 um, staff has reviewed the most recent submission um, and extensively, uh, you know, a lot of our issues and prior concerns have been addressed or few outstanding items. Um, one just question that we'd like to have a little bit better understanding about the 75-foot uh, no disturbance stream setback as shown on the plans. There does appear to be some encroachment in that, and I'm not sure if that was an issue that was addressed as part of the DEP permitting process, which I should also mention we do have in hand the DEP permit. Um, but again, just sort of like to understand that a little bit better. A um, few other um, minor comments. Uh, I think maybe the most significant outstanding item that remains and it's really highlighted in Jim Wendell, the town engineer's memo, has to do with concerns of um, uh, that a geotechnical evaluation of the, sta uh, the stability of the road embankment at the river crossing be completed. Um, Mr. Uh, Wendell has suggested that um, this is an item that really could be covered as part of a construction phasing of the project, uh, but once the subsoils are, are basically scoured and, and it can be seen that the uh, geotechnical evaluation could be done and, the engin and proper engineering uh, methods applied to ensure stability of the uh, soils uh, that will be uh, put on top of those. Um, the, the, the concern has to do with potential sloughing or scouring uh, based on sort of the mucky, uh, sort of gooey subsoils, if you will. Um, and so uh, staff has, um, <coughs> as I said, I, I think there, there's a pathway forward with that item. Um, I guess the one item that I did uh, uh, forget to put on my memo and had been discussed, but I'm not sure if the board ever came to a conclusion, was the applicant has uh, been asking for a uh, waiver of the recreation fees, for, or actually really an in lieu, um, for the park improvements that they're making. 
Um, in reviewing what's being proposed, uh, the purpose of the recreation uh, impact fee is really to offset the town's public facilities. Um, and really, they've only been waived when the facilities are designed for public use, not necessarily for the neighborhood use. The VR2, the VR4, and some of our other zones require open spaces anyway. Um, so at this point, staff's not prepared to support the uh, in lieu of fee, um, but of course that, that's at the board's discretion. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, as I mentioned, a lot of the uh, bigger elements of staff's prior concerns have been addressed. We have drafted a uh, motion for the board to consider with waivers and conditions. Um, with that, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Good evening, Mr. Thompson. Good evening. Jim, thank you. Uh, Bill Thompson with BH2M Engineers here for the Sawgrass uh, final plan submission. Uh, Joe Fristacci is here for Star Homes, who is the applicant. As Jay indicated, we were last here September 15th. Uh, the board had some comments and fine-tuning some of the notes and details that uh, Jay's uh, department and also Jim Wendell and uh, Wright Pierce uh, came back with some comments. So we went back and, and looked at those, and my submission um, letters that were dated September 22nd was my first response um, to some of those things. And uh, on, on Jay's memo, we amended note 27, which really clarified the focal point stormwater uh, maintenance and responsibilities, and that was also updated in the Homeowners Association documents to, uh, to make that very clear. Uh, we also added in the homeowners docs uh, appendix two which is the town's post-construction stormwater uh, ordinance and there's a form that gets signed at final after final approval uh, between the town and the applicant to make sure that is all <coughs> done in conformance with that regulation uh, we've revised the subdivision plat to show the uh, easements for the bio filtration systems uh, that there's a note on there that clearly outlines that these easements for the benefit of the homeowners association for their maintenance and operation within the town right of way <clears throat> which again just just clarifies for everybody um, who's responsible uh, at the last meeting joe Fristacci updated the uh, board on the uh, affordable housing um, for the one lot that uh, the ordinance allows us to add to this which we've done uh, we've updated note nine which is uh, just highlights the residential calculation supporting the zoning, the additional lot under the, uh, the VR4 zone so to get us to the 24 lots. So note nine was updated for that. Traffic engineer, we added the 24th lot, did not have our original report from them uh, outlining the, tw the, the extra lot that had 23 lots. <coughs> there was an additional impact fee that was uh, calculated and that was submitted to Jay's office. Uh, another little thing that was picked up at the last meeting, the side lot line for lot 19 didn't have the 50 feet, <coughs> uh, the width up through the setbacks, so that adjusted um, the frontage on lot 19 and adjusted the area on lot 18, uh, but we do have the minimum uh, 5,000 square feet. Note 10 was amended, uh, again, uh, allowing for the reduction in setbacks per the ordinance, and we also label a typical scenario uh, between lots 15 and 16 to just show the the developer the builder the homeowner what, what the uh, what the options are typical to any of those lots um, we added a note along the rear of lots 1 through 10 which uh, states that the setback cannot be reduced as we abut a residential um, area and that needs to conform to the setback shown on the plan 75 foot setback along lot number one has been identified as a no disturb stream and I'll go into that what that means and what we uh, interpret or, or what we're, we're going to do our goal for that setback uh, I did uh, Jay highlighted our recreational um, improvements or the, or the uh, requirement um, I did a just a short narrative in my submission <coughs> on the recreation improvements and it just states that the applicant has approached the proposed recreation improvements trying to provide amenities that will suit the demographics of the homeowners. This site provides six and a half acres of open space that will allow for cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, or a relaxed walk. The open space area is also a great spot for picking blueberries, obviously in season. Um, <clears throat> we've also realized that the area between lots 18 through 24 offers a level area for the proposed improvements. This area can be accessed from Sumac Lane uh, near Lot 18 and continue behind Lots 18 through 24. 
this will be delineated with a stone dust surface. Our proposal for this area includes large landscape boulders for climbing, multiple park benches, four areas of victory gardens, and an area for lawn bowling, which is also called bocce. Uh, to address the concerns of buffering behind the lots 18 through 24, we're proposing to install uh, two sections of a rail fence at each lot corner on the, on the open space side of the, uh, the pins, and that way the lot owner knows what their limits are and the people utilizing the open space will also know what their, their limits are so there's no issue with uh, encroaching uh, any, any of the, uh, the neighbor's property. Uh, also, prior to the last meeting, uh, we had received comments from Jim Wendell's office, and I submitted a letter September 22nd on that, and he had some issues with the paving on Sumac Lane, which we've created a, a consistent 20-foot-wide uh, roadway. We've adjusted some catch basins to give him what he requires, what the ordinance requires, of 3.75 feet of cover over any pipe. We have certified that the existing 72-inch culvert that was installed uh, for a previous owner does meet all of the AASHTO standards, and it is in great condition, can be used with additional sections to, ex uh, to extend that crossing. Um, he asked for some more details out on Sawyer Road, a test pit where the catch basin is going to go, in a cross section on the sidewalk, just so the contractor and anyone involved knows we're going to have a curb, a shoulder sidewalk, and uh, the drainage uh, improvements along the back side of that sidewalk. J uh, Jim had indicated he didn't know the uh, note was on there for cable. Uh, all the cables will be uh, in conduit. That note is on there. He added some more details to the typical light pole, which I've used on other projects in Scarborough, um, just a bolting assembly that he asked for. Uh, the detailed sidewalk ramps already had the ADA panels on there, and, and Jim may have just missed that. And then the uh, notes on the plan for the, uh, the timing of picking the plants out for the focal point treatments. So those two letters, I believe, addressed um, what we, what we uh, were asked of at the last meeting. And the staff comments for tonight's meeting, there's a half a dozen here, I'll run down through them. Um, Jay has some notes that will go on the plan concerning the no disturb buffer. Um, there were two. Uh, and there was a concern about the path that, that uh, comes around the back side of lot 24. Uh, with the 75 foot setback, which is a no disturb stream setback, and the corner of lot 24, I have about eight feet of uh, space within that easement that uh, I believe can accommodate the stone dust walkway and not. Uh, disturb that 75 foot setback because that is that is a, a, a setback without going at, going for a uh, permit by rule or any sort of uh, disturbance in it. And I don't think we need to. I think uh, in eight feet the level uh, the grades out there are very level. I think I can get the walkway the pathway to come in around that. And we also you know propose to set uh, the number three iron rods with caps um, around that entire um, 75 foot setback. Uh, with the exception of Lot 1. Lot 1 has a 75-foot setback, and we gave an additional 10-foot of setback so that contractors could work uh, on a house and not be in that 75-foot setback. So with that, 75-foot um, setback is sort of connected to Lot 1, if you will. Uh, we're also proposing a rail fence along that setback. I haven't told Joe that yet. Uh, in addition to the number three rebars, so that really protects that area, because that's the only area that's really within a buildable area or building area. So I, I believe that that would, that would uh, satisfy the concerns that uh, code might have or, or anybody that's uh, reviewing the site construction out there. <coughs> excuse me, Joe, uh, Jim, uh, excuse me, Jay had uh, sheet three. We had mislabeled a lot, which we uh, corrected. And then the concern about uh, uh, Jim Wendell, um, a scour issue in the, in the geotechnical issue. What we've got to remember is this culvert was installed and that road that is there now was constructed for some purpose. This isn't, um, this isn't clay, crappy soil. This is, a, this is a constructed road that crossed over an existing stream. Um, the scour issue, uh, we have a, a photograph we had submitted with our letter. Uh, the, the location of the 72-inch culvert now uh, is well stable, inlet and outlet with riprap. And the thing we have to remember also is we're not adding any more water to this culvert. This culvert is handling an upstream drainage area that's been certified, redes uh, not redesigned, but calculated 
to support the 72-inch dam. So that stream flow is not changing as a result of this project. All we need to do is extend it to get our town road across it. So I don't really think there's a, an issue. Uh, we'd be happy to work with the geotech engineer during construction. Uh, this is going to be an extension of, of whatever that fill material is in there. It's not going to be clay, mucky clay, that we encountered earlier on in our stormwater design uh, further away from this, um, this crossing. And those mucky soils, those soft clay, were down deeper than the stream. Those test pits we did, which we abandoned, uh, were not at stream level. They were below stream level, and, and again, we're not, we're not going into that design at all. So, again, I don't think we have an issue extending the culvert in the stream. It'll be stabilized, built to DEP and Army Corps standards. Um, but if, if Jay or Jim or, or the code office during construction, um, we can revisit that <coughs> to see if we're having any issues. So um, that's you know, what, uh, what I have for comments on that. Uh, Jim Wendell, again, his memo for tonight's meeting. Um, Two of the easements on the plan for the focal point seven and eight are too small. Well, I, I made them consistent with the others, but it's just a line. It's just an easement line. We can we can add that. And Jim's e uh, easements aren't <coughs> required until after construction, so that's <coughs> not an issue. Uh, the easement along the rear of lots 19 to 24 for that trail, he, he doesn't want it. He doesn't want the town to ever be involved with that, which is fine. Um, he had a, a question about the sewer location and the water main location on the plan. I checked the plans today. They're there. They're, they're shown very, very clear. He may have just missed them. Um, he wants a drain manhole on the angle points of that curtain drain, just a small two-foot diameter, which I think maybe like two points, which, again, we have no issue with. His next comment I just covered on the 72-inch culvert. And along <coughs> the, uh, the culvert crossing, uh, the 72-inch culvert crossing on the roadway, uh, two to three feet out from the uh, edge of the sidewalk or the shoulder grass shelf. Uh, he would like a four-foot-high black vinyl coated chain link fence, um, just again for, for a public safety issue, which we have no, no problem with. So uh, the last sheet um, is a wooded and current comment, and uh, they've, they've uh, agreed with our analysis on the 72-inch culvert. And again, their, their comments um, sort of parallel uh, gems on the issue of is there a need for a geotechnical, which, again, we said would, would work with, with the town, with the code officer, or, or Jim Wendell if that need arises. With that, I conclude. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I'll turn it over to the board to see if they have any questions. I do. Ron, um, thank you. This is a, a actually addressed to a Jay. Uh, I, it, it went by so fast. You, you mentioned about the recreation, yep. and you weren't comfortable. Based on the comments tonight, is there any change in your thinking? Uh, no. I, I mean, he basically echoed what was in their submission. Um, yeah, I think one way of thinking of the recreation uh, fees are <coughs> like thinking of a traffic impact fee. Um, projects have to mitigate impacts right in and around their project, you know, have to make road improvements, what have you. But then there's also um, impacts outside of the neighborhood, failing intersections throughout the town that they have to pay for their particular impacts on. And, and that's really what the, the recreation impact uh, contribution was designed for. It was established many years ago uh, prior to my coming to town. But it's, it's really designed to um, address sort of deficiencies of public facilities that um, uh, need to be uh, addressed for the additional homes that are uh, being established. So. So, so we still have an issue with that. So correct. They're asking for the in lieu fee and this point, Seth, is, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll work at the direction of the board, but we don't think this meets the uh, standard for waiving that. Okay. My second question to you is uh, based on, on the geo mm -hmm. aspects of things. Are you comfortable, <coughs> I don't want you to talk with Jim, but are you yep. comfortable with, with the fact that uh, we're sort of, we're 
give our permission to do things midstream. Yep, and um, that Jim actually mentioned that in his memo that he actually thought sort of during construction would be the best time to do it because uh, I know the applicant just sort of mentioned that the culvert's there. Well, the culvert's actually going to be relocated slightly and added onto, so there's going to be all the earthwork is going to be moved around, so it, the subsoil should be become pretty apparent, and so a geotech on site can sort of take a look, understand what the best uh, pathway forward to ensure stabilization. Uh, because though there is a stream crossing, right now it's not a road that's used every day. And the concerns I heard echoed by the engineers were that it's that everyday use and vibrations, what, what might that do to those subsoils and might they give out? So, um, you know, right now it's a stream crossing that's probably been crossed. You know, there was some logging there at one point, but outside of that, it really hasn't been used extensively as it will be. Um, so, yeah, I think... As I mentioned, I believe I mentioned at the outset in my draft, in the staff's draft motion, we've drafted a condition that echoes Jim Wendell's um, comments from his memo. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hold off and hear what other board members have to say about the first point. <coughs> John? I'm all right. Second. Corey? Yeah, I don't think I have any questions. Um, appreciate the responsiveness of the comments and some of the clarification, the willingness to work with the town engineer and geotech. Um, and uh, I concur with staff's recommendation on the uh, fee. All right. Thank you. Dave? Thank you. Uh, just one one item, Bill. Sure. <coughs> Can you uh, summarize for me again uh, the I don't know what you call a pathway that runs between or behind lots 18 and 24 and how that will be built and sure um, we're, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a pathway stone dust pathway that'll come in and it'll come back along these lots back out here and our recreation that I described will be in this area here so just a simple stone dust four to five foot wide so people neighbors can come in this way and come back out over here, and it'll all be out of the wetlands. Will there be any fencing between that pathway and, and those lots, 18 through 24? Yes, we're, we're proposing just at the corners, you know, a section of, of rail fence. I'm drawing it too far out, but it would be at every corner so the people on the walk would see, and they're, you know. So, so to delineate. The limits uh, of open the space to a lot. Correct. <clears throat> okay. Yep. All right. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Nick? I think this has um, come up before on a previous submission, but the um, bioretention cells, I, this is this could be proposed as a public street at some point, I assume. Correct. Yeah. It's, is this a problem? I mean, we had talked about this on another project, right. about bioretention cells being maintained by the town. Correct. So, yep. um, how does the town feel about absorbing these bio? Sure. These are these are a little bit. These are uh, biofiltration. <laughs> They're slightly different. They're, but this, essentially the same idea. You're right. Typically, we try to keep uh, stormwater facilities outside the public right away, um, and we talked about this a little bit uh, or quite a bit um, at the previous meeting. But one of the one of the issues that ar arose with this application and is really something that staff has seen. DEP is sort of ta starting to take a different tack to stormwater approach, and particularly where, as we've talked about in a number of instances, a lot of the sites that we are developing now aren't quite as easy to develop as maybe uh, they were 20 years ago. Um, and so the approach to having the biofiltration uh, systems within the right-of-way is something that um, the public works director uh, uh, town engineer and planning staff were heavily involved with meeting with the applicant and really understanding the potential impacts and again understanding sort of the um, transition in the in stormwater modeling or, or approaches if you will staff has agreed to allow for the filtration uh, systems to be within the right of way but it's clearly noted on the plan that the maintenance in operation is the responsibility of the homeowners association. We've been very careful to document that through the uh, homeowners docs, the DEP permit, 
on the subdivision plat itself. I think that was one of the comments uh, that Mr. Wendell echoed that one of the easement areas was just a little bit too short. We would need to make sure that's demonstrated properly. Um, and, and so uh, at this point, staff's comfortable with the approach. Uh, again, recognizing that you know, sh when should the road be accepted by the town council that the maintenance will still be the responsibility of the homeowners association. That would be a condition the council would set forth, or it's on the, the count. If the council chooses to accept them, then that's at their discretion. But it is fully noted on the plan, right. the intent, the purpose. It's in the homeowners docs. Um, I think the problem I have with the homeowners docs, though, <coughs> of course I should have highlighted it. Yeah. Um, it does say that the two two conditions have to be met in order for the association to stop maintaining it, and one of them was um, the town accepting the road, right. the road is public. Um, so I guess my question goes back to if we accept it as public, we're all of a sudden taking care of the, the, the biofiltration cells. Um, yeah. According to the documents, because the only way yep. to stop that from happening would be if the council saying, no, we'll take the road, but, you know, the biopotential cells are still yours, the filtration cells, sorry. I, that, I'll find the yep. which I just want to. Yeah, I, um, yeah, in staff's review of the homeowner stocks, we were fairly comfortable. You know, the board, this board can't uh, dictate to the council what they will or won't do. Um, but I think what this board can do is clearly note what the intent is. If the board, if the council sees fit to take on greater responsibilities, then that's their discretion and their role as the executive body. Um, so, yes, okay. if, if that's a significant concern of board members, then that's going to be a concern you may continue to have. And <laughs> but um, I just, want, yep. I guess, my, from my perspective, I wanted to make sure that um, the town was understood yep. that according to these documents, it sounds to me like the association could at some point you will have to hope for maintenance on those. Yeah, on, page, on page five. five. I kind of question that too. Yeah, it's uh, if four you, three. If you read note number 27 on the flat, sheet one, okay. it more or less states, if I'm reading it correctly, <coughs> that the owner or the or the association, if you will, could in fact petition the town council to accept everything, mm -hmm. but B more or less says that they might be able to accept the street but not the filtration system, at least that's how I'm reading it. So it looks like yep. the town council has the option to take it all or only take the street less the filtration system. That's how I'm reading that. Now yep. everybody else can make their own. Yeah. And as as I stated, I mean, there are I've, in the seven years I've been in town. I mean, there's been subdivision plans that right on it note this road is to remain public or private, and the council has has accepted them. You know, would I think they've made you know there's been corrections, but policies change in time. It may prove that um, there may come a time. 10, 15, 20 years down the road where these biofiltration systems become the norm, become something the town is accepting and implementing themselves, and it may become reasonable at that point for the town to accept these. So I don't think uh, the intent isn't to necessarily shut the door on ever accepting them because, again, we these are fairly new in, in Maine anyway, and particularly in the town of Scarborough. And so what staff's primary concern was really making sure that we, there's very good understanding of what those maintenance operations costs are moving forward. And it could be that if they prove themselves to be very efficient in, cost, in terms of cost and maintenance, that it becomes viable and reasonable for the town to accept them. So, um, Okay. I'm, I, I guess I, my point would be I think I'd like to see the the page five here in the, I'm, I'm sure this is mm -hmm. finalized. You have the uh, homeowners association. It's not not until until yeah. after final approval gets reviewed by the attorney, signed by every time um, uh, it gets recorded later. Because yeah. it, on under, I'll just read you the excerpt. It says the association shall be responsible for the cost of maintaining and repairing open space drainage easements. Da, da,
dot, dot, dot. The association shall only bear such responsibility if the roadway and certain, uh, I can't say that word, appurtenances, mm -hmm. neither A, being maintained and repaired by another third party user, or nor B, accepted as a town, as a town way by the town of Scarborough. So it sounds to me like if, if a homeowner came to you and said, well, you guys accepted my roadway, why do you guys want us to take care of these you know, bioretention cells. I, I has my documents say that once you take my road, you guys take care of it, and you take care of the expense now. Uh, what I'm saying is I, I, I don't want to see a conflict between the town and the homeowner association over conflicting language. Mm -hmm. um, a quick cleanup of the town of Scarborough with, a, you know, with approval by the council to take ownership. I mean, some just what I'm saying is some sort of clarifying um, portion there would be nice. And then I noticed on page two, it says 22 lots, right at the top of the sheet, it should be 24 lots. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. That was, that's the extent of my question. That's all I had. I just wanted to make sure that mm -hmm. we were aware of what we could possibly take on as a, as a town down the road. I guess as a follow-up question, if I may interject, what would take precedence? A homeowner's, a home association document or the plat that gets signed? Take precedent in, in terms of what? In, Someone in, coming in to the... In terms of the responsibility of the town. The responsibility only becomes the town should the council accept them. So I think regardless... Even if they're homeowner docs. Even if they're homeowner docs. All right. But it, I think the docs should clarify Oh, yeah. That. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's and I, I think we can write a condition that talks about revising homeowner docs to resolve possible conflicts in language. It, would that? I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Yep. Okay. Again, from my perspective, I also want to um, thank the, the applicant for being willing to take a look at the geotech survey or the, the information at the time of construction. I think that's the proper way to handle it as well. A little bit different when you're not necessary. When you have the opportunity to know and you take advantage of it, you stand a much better chance of having a successful end. So that's great that we're doing that. It sounds like uh, the no buffer stuff has been decided. Uh, I also am not in favor of waiving the rec fee. Um, and the, I have a question because I couldn't find it, and I'd be totally um, letting myself down if I didn't have to ask the question. But I may have missed it, but can you tell me if these are painted crosswalks or textured? Um, can we finally go with you know, painted? Paint leave. Yeah. With, yeah. Can we get those textured? Um, Typically, for ones that Other are going to be in that? a public in a right away, case? the public works director doesn't like to accept the sort of therm or textured. Okay. Um, typically, looks for. He's yeah, looking for non. Standard, it's painted. I think okay. Was yeah, I think I agree. I'll remember I'll that discussion. I'll let it go. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I guess I'm. Um, I think we've answered the other questions, uh, especially if we get the other condition. Yep. Mr. Mazur, Mr. DuPont. What's the rec fee? Uh, I believe it's $500 per lot in the gross area, as I recall. Uh, yes. Yes. <coughs> okay. Uh, I'm not, Last chance? I'm not in favor of wavering it either. Okay. Um, any other comments from the board? Do you have a condition? Another condition. I do. I'll, I'll read it when you get there. All right. Thank you. I won't you. force you to read my handwriting. That <laughs> wouldn't be fair. All right. Uh, I am going to move to approve the application of Star Homes, Inc. prepared by BH2M under the provisions of the Scar Town of Scarborough <coughs> Zoning Ordinance and Subdivision Ordinance for the final subdivision plan of Sawgrass Subdivision with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings. 
The applicant proposes a 24 lot residential subdivision on 13.701 acre parcel off of Sawyer Road. The residential subdivision is located within the Village Residential 4 District and has been designed in accordance with the Village Development Standards set forth therein. The Planning Board finds that the subdivision meets the residential density regulations of the VR4 District by incorporating one additional unit beyond the standard maximum base residential de density because the additional unit is designated as an affordable housing unit. The Planning Board has reviewed the applicant's proposed plan and related materials as submitted and finds that the final subdivision plan meets the performance standards of Sections 4 and 6 of the subdivision ordinance with the following waivers and conditions. Waivers. Permit the proposed subdivision road to be constructed at a width of 20 feet rather than the town standard of 24. Due to the scale of the development and the off-site pedestrian improvements provided on Sawyer Road, the board waived the requirement for sidewalks on both sides of the proposed road network. Finding no other practical alternative for creating a connected internal street network, the board allowed alteration of wetlands to a contiguous wetland feature which exceeds 1,500 square feet. Conditions. The subdivision shall be constructed in accordance with the subdivision plan set entitled Sawgrass as prepared by BH2M revised September 22, 2014 to be further revised to address staff and town engineer comments. During construction, the town engineer and applicant shall coordinate a geotechnical evaluation of the stability of the subgrade under the two 72-inch culverts and the road embankment. Stabilization of the area shall occur at the direction of the town engineer based on input of the geotechnical evaluation. Prior to the release of the attested final subdivision plan to the applicant for recording at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, the applicant shall pay the required traffic impact fees totaling $25,016.73 execute and record all documentation necessary to comply with the town's post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. Prior to the issuance of building permits, a recreational contribution in the amount of $500 shall be paid. And revise the homeowners association documents to resolve possible conflicts of language in terms of future maintenance responsibilities of stormwater facilities within the right-of-way. I said 1,500. Thank you. Uh, I said 1,500 square feet. I meant 15,000 square feet. Thank you, Karen. One other just clarification for me. Number two on the waivers. If you read it, it almost gives them permission not to build any roadways. They're still building it on one side, isn't that correct? Correct, yes, that's shown on the plants. Um, if you, if you yeah. read it, you know what I'm saying? I think we're covered, though, because we also said they have to build it based, if you go down, uh, where is it? The subdivision shall be constructed in accordance with the subdivision plan set entitled Sawgrass. With the, okay. with the name and date. So the right. sidewalks are clearly shown okay, on that? Yeah, I'm okay. Understood, but I think we're covered. Any other discussion? Was there a second? I'm sorry. I second. I'll second it. Mr. Mazur. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And I show that to be, <coughs> excuse me, unanimous. Thank you. All right, thank you. He will give me the Again, item number five, Foster Farm subdivision has been tabled this evening at the request of the applicant. 
as well as item number seven, Waterhouse Acres Subdivision. Uh, bringing us to item number six, Burnham Heights Subdivision, Star Homes Inc. requests a preliminary review for a five lot subdivision off Burnham Road. Mr. Chase. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just note at the outset that we have received two letters on this item uh, that have been forwarded to the board, one from a Mr. and Mrs. Spencer of 125 Burnham Road, and a second letter from a Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Helene, I believe it is, of 128 Burnham Road. Um, copies of those are on the record and have been provided to the board. Um, let's see, so uh, as suggested, this is a subdivision for five lots off Burnham Road. This is in the RF, or Rural Farming District, of the community. As board members will likely note from many of our subdivisions in this district, uh, there's most, uh, the subdivision triggers the requirements for a conservation subdivision design. Ostensibly what that requires is that 50% of the land be maintained as open space. Uh, and as sort of a trade-off for that, uh, lot sizes are allowed uh, to uh, have a minimum lot size of 30,000 square foot and a minimum lot frontage of 100 square feet. As part of the sort of outset of coming up with a density determination for a given property, the applicant really is uh, in required to go through a two-step process. One is through a net residential calculation uh, 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 scenario in which they it, um, come up with the amount of uplands that are available for development. In addition to that, the applicant also needs to demonstrate, at least at a concept level, a subdivision plan that shows a lot layout in compliance with the underlying space and bulk standards uh, of the zone. In this case, uh, minimum lot size in a standard or conventional subdivision would be 80,000 square feet with 200 feet of frontage. Um, the applicant provided a conventional layout last Wednesday, which was uh, provided to the board on through Dropbox. Staff had some issues, uh, some concerns with that, and uh, particularly given it didn't appear that one of the right-of-ways was 50 feet wide, the applicant provided a second one, um, a second conventional layout, which wasn't provided to the board because it came well after your standard policy for reviewing new items. Staff has begun a cursory review of it, but we haven't uh, been able to get in-depth on it to, to date, but um, we do have some thoughts based on our cursory review, and um, should the applicant uh, have some thoughts on that item. Uh, some other comments we have is it in um, ensuring that the open space calculations are, are properly managed. As noted, 50% of the parcel is required to be open space, but that open space needs to meet certain criteria and thresholds uh, with regards to uh, meeting a uh, one acre threshold of uh, contiguous areas, applying a 25 foot wetland buffer, um, and the like. Um, one of the uh, uh, concerns that was brought up during our interdepartment meeting by the Public Works Director is really echoed in Jim Wendell's town engineer report, has to do with the Public Works um, uh, issues that they've run into in this area uh, in regards to stormwater or really it's sort of the lack of relief in the area. This is very flat. Um, water doesn't move very well through the site. And so, uh, as is suggested in Mr. Wendell's end, uh, memo, uh, we'd really uh, seek for the applicant to develop a more detailed drainage management plan uh, so we can have a better understanding of potential impacts. Um, in addition, we we'll received a memo from Woodard and Kern, the town's peer review engineer, as well as Bill Bray. Um, the applicant is seeking a waiver for a traffic uh, to, 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 pr to provide a traffic analysis report. Uh, staff requested Bill Bray on the, on the board's behalf to conduct a site visit and uh, as well as an impact fee analysis. He has conducted the impact fee analysis and made some suggestion, suggestions with regards to sight lines and potential uh, uh, vegetation clearing uh, in that regard. One thing that staff would just offer is the board and applicant might want to think um, 
about Mr. Bray's recommendation in terms of vegetation removal, in terms of sort of the rural context that we're talking about. Oftentimes, street trees play an important component for a neighborhood, and just really understanding what um, what it's going to take, what type of vegetation removal we're really talking about, I think would be um, might be something the board would wish to explore. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I turn it back to you. Um, turn it back to you. Thank you, Jay. Once again, good evening. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Again, Bill Thompson, dh 2 Engineers, again here with uh, Joe Fristacci from Star Homes. Uh, as Jay indicated, we have a 16-acre uh, site, 16.3 uh, acres on the Burnham Road. Um, we're proposing a conservation subdivision that's in the RF zone. Uh, the first plan I have up here is a conventional um, lot layout for the five lots at traditional 80,000 square feet, 200 feet of frontage. We had an earlier one and we had a, an issue with a um, um, less than 50 foot wide uh, existing uh, strip of land uh, that we could not use. So we've uh, conducted this conventional and we're, we're comfortable, but we understand <laughs> Jay's uh, department needs to, to further that review. So we've, uh, we've gone forward with uh, on the other side here of, of looking at how a conservation subdivision uh, would fit in here. The, um, the site basically uh, grades from the <coughs> road back to the back of the lot. There are wetlands in the back along with uh, Central Main Power uh, right-of-way. And it is fairly flat. Uh, we do have uh, test bits for on-site septic. Uh, the soils uh, for groundwater was anywhere between 16 and 22 inches, which far exceeds what the uh, state uh, minimum of seven inches would be. So uh, the soils found up to that uh, level were, were sandy, so uh, we feel that the uh, septic locations would work well. Uh, we will have individual wells on each lot. Um, overhead power is on our side of Burnham Road. It does cross over at this point here for lot one, but the other lots could be served uh, off the existing um, power line service that's in the street. Uh, there was a question came up about uh, fire protection. Uh, there is an existing fire tank on Dunn Estates Drive, which is basically 300 feet away from the Burnham Road. So we believe that that, assuming that's in working order and the fire chief concurs, uh, that could uh, provide the fire protection for these five lots. Um, Jay uh, had some comments about the conventional plan with the five lots, as I indicated, and will allow more time for that to be looked at. We will add notes about open space and homeowners association. There will be common open space. We have about 11 acres of open space, which basically surrounds the, the, the lots. Uh, the 25-foot buffer from the wetlands will be shown. When, when I read the ordinance, and I, I read it uh, a lot, I misunderstood the 25-foot setback needs to be in the open space. So we do need to adjust uh, a couple lot lines. We have the area and, and the land to do it. So. I've got a couple of red lines here, which, pardon me, we will adjust those lots. And again, we had a little corner of a wetland up here on lot five, and we'll create that 25-foot setback. It'll make some small changes to the property, but we have enough frontage and area to, to accomplish that. 75-foot um, <clears throat> forested buffer, um, we have that proposed along the back of the lot, because from this point, it does grade back. It's just um, an additional stormwater uh, treatment that um, may not be required, but uh, it's a good uh, indicator of, of trying to manage. Uh, you've got to understand we're just going to have a house, garage, and a driveway. There will be no internal road. There's not a lot of new impervious. There's no parking lots, et cetera. So it's a very minimal um, increase, if you will, in, in uh, the impervious area. Uh, Public Works had a concern about uh, drainage and, and ditches out here on the road. I went out there again today. Um, there are some semblance of some ditches, but there's no r real direction um, on you know where this water goes. There's a wetland here and, it, and across the street. Uh, it's wet. There doesn't appear to be any culvert. Uh, where our land does tend to grade back toward the, the north, our proposal would be, and we do have a high point you know, on fairly near the front of these lots, is to create the, the house lots here, build them up a couple of feet, get the grade back, and I think we can we can present a grading plan uh, that would support a foundation drain. <coughs> Excuse me. I have an elevation of about 140, 142 at the street and 135 out here. So we put the houses up a couple of feet and, and get a foundation drain to, 
to grade. So I can really pull most of the water from the development back to the rear of the lots uh, and minimize um, the concerns that uh, Public Works and uh, Jim Wendell might have with the uh, with the grading. So again, we can we can create a, a more detailed, bigger plan showing how each of these lots can be graded with the septic system, well location, and uh, again try to try to minimize and get most of the water and have it go through the uh, vegetated buffer. I, I would, you know, before I qualify what this buffer can and cannot do, uh, I may need to run a foundation drain uh, to the rear of the lot. So I'd want to have that provision uh, in the in the buffer that a one-time uh, connection to a to an under drain foundation drain traffic engineer um, I, I asked for a waiver in the study because we'll agree with Bill Bray he comes back with an assessment I think there's only one trip a thousand dollar fee uh, site distance is fine uh, providing we do some trimming along the right-of-way again out there today at a 35 mile an hour speed limit there were no major site issues but again uh, trimming some of the vegetation uh, would certainly help um, would it incur in, uh, they just said uh, delineate the uh, forested buffer with iron rods with the caps as we've talked about at the last project that uh, any protection to those would be done with a with an iron rod with a no buffer no disturbed buffer cap on them so that uh, summarizes what we're here to present and uh, we'll entertain any questions all right thank you Nick? Oh, excuse me Yes. God. I'd be lost without you tonight. Thank you very much. Again, it doesn't matter how, how big I make the letters, does it? Um, as is our policy, we do offer an opportunity for public comment this evening on this item uh, as it's the first time it has come to us in the form of a uh, uh, preliminary review so if there's anybody here from the public who'd like to discuss this item or make comments to the board we ask that you approach your podium please state your name and address for the record we also ask that you try to minimize your or, or hold your comments if you would please to five minutes um, for the sake of um, uh, the other items on our agenda this evening so if anybody would like to make some comments please do so now Hi, my name is uh, Tim Boardman of A Blueberry Lane, and I just have a couple questions about this plan here. Um, if this subdivision lot gets approved, um, is that all the development that's going to be, all future development will be curtailed to just these five lots on this site? Because I'm noticing two spaces here, large tracts of land in these areas, that if this plan gets approved, what's left in open space according to the current plan or pr proposed plan will stay that way and these these further areas won't be able to be developed additionally in the future is that correct that is correct yes they would be open space essentially there uh, as we sort of talked about at the outset the net residential density um, allows for five lots that's it so um, the remainder would be open space Okay, and I only I have one additional question for the for the developers. I see a right away here. That, what is the purpose of that right away? The one thing Where that is it going? we'll address the questions for you. I mean, I can't have no, that's fine. dialogue going back and forth, but that's one of my questions as well. Thank you. So, <clears throat> anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Board. Is it Boardman? Boardman, yeah. Boardman. Um, my name is Eileen Spencer, and I live at 125 Burnham Road. I happen to be right across the street from the bus right here. And so I did submit a letter, but I was going to read, read the letter. Um, um, Burnham Road is located in West Scarborough, which is zoned as a spacious area of town and allows for outdoor recreation as hunting and snowmobiling, etc. The RF building requirements are in place to support this rural setting. As current owners, we purchased our land knowing that future constructions would also follow these same zoning laws, protecting our neighborhood design. This proposed subdivision layout has a, deter has a detrimental effect, I feel, on the fair market value of our abutting properties um, from the overcrowding and extremely small lot sizes directly on Burnham Road and not following the RF zoning that we've, that we've followed. 
The current plan is a cluster of five homes and overcrowded the build buildable areas with only 658 feet of road frontage. The current RF requirements as stated on the plan require a minimum of 80,000 square feet lot. Four of the five lots have less than 40,000 square feet, and I do note with the conservation that it's more flexible. But we are all 80,000 square feet on the, on the road. Um, so the ones that are less than 40,000 is, is less than 50% of the minimum requirement. All five lots have a setback of only 25 feet, with the required minimum of us being 50 feet. Um, and approximately 100 foot road frontage is also being asked while there's a minimum of 200 feet in the RF zone. These proposed measurements are inconsistent with every other house on the road. And it's actually, I don't, it doesn't keep up with our current neighborhood. Star's, Star Home is requesting to place five driveways on this blind curve. And I think it'd be really important to do a travel study. It's 35 miles per hour. And we all know people are going at least 45, 55 miles an hour on that curve. Um, we are a definite commuter road between Saco, Buxton, and into, into Portland. And I hope when they do that travel study, it's, in the, it's during commuting, commuting hours. Um, let me see. Um, I have actually had, after uh, several potential accidents on our road, um, on our corner, I've asked the town of Scar, but we do have a hidden driveway sign right before our driveway. Um, there have been accidents on that curve, one being in my front yard. We came home from a, from a uh, uh, vacation, and we had a big burnt tree. A car went off the road, hit our tree, and 25 feet into our yard, we had, we had some fire damage and some landscaping damage. So I find this blind curve very hazardous, and it adds to the public health concerns and the pedestrian safety. There's a lot of people walking on that road. There's a lot of people walking their dogs. We have no shoulders on that road. I feel that this uh, proposed subdivision has a large area of unbuildable and unusable land. The conservation subdivision laws were not intended to take advantage of unusable land and allow builders to benefit from overcrowding homes in a very small parcels, directly and negatively impacting us as neighbors. When Dunn Estate subdivision was built on Burnham Road, it was designed um, and all the homes accessed a common road and, um, which, and they also protected their wetlands. They also uh, had to landscape across from that to protect the houses across from the street um, from, from, the, from the new development. I find this subdivision does not follow subdivision friendly atmosphere by adding to the current neighborhood, nor do the builders have the responsibility to develop a common road, sidewalks, there's no curbs. Um, Star Homes has proposed to build Burning Heights uh, subdivision, and I don't fear that this subdivision, but to it, I, I feel like this subdivision is just trying to, to squeeze in these five lots on a very short period of the road. Thank you for your listening, and I hope you, you know, listen to our concerns. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. My name is uh, James Whipple. I live at uh, 120 Burnham Road, which is this lot right here. I uh, purchased that house uh, maybe eight years ago, and one of our considerations was uh, the zoning of that house. And it was 80,000 square feet, a little less than two acres. Uh, we felt that uh, that was a good area to go. It was giving us good protection. Anybody else wanted to build on 80,000 square feet, that would be great. Uh, all the houses in that area all agree with the um, residential farm uh, zoning. Our house does. Uh, all the houses on Donna Estates, some of those are as high as three and a half acres or even more. And they were all residential farm <coughs> zoning. And they spent the money for what they had to do. Um, the Spencer's house meets those requirements. I believe all the houses meet those requirements. Uh, I'm just concerned now. I'm getting older. I'm thinking in terms of maybe going to a smaller house. And just the fact that this proposal has come up has probably already devalued my house some. If it goes through, it will devalue it probably a lot more with five tight spots like that. And when I bought the house, I thought, well, okay, the town has zoning laws. I guess they put them in place for a reason, and <coughs> uh, I should be protected, but I'm not sure that I am. Um, I'm not sure on the location of the, where they're going to put these houses uh, on the lots and exactly where the septic systems are. 
I mean, that's a concern of mine because I abut that property. I abut lot number five. My well is maybe 11 feet from the property line. Now, I don't know where they're going to put septic tanks, septic systems. But I, and I know, I believe there's a code that says septic systems have to be a certain distance from drilled wells. And uh, I'm just concerned that that could be uh, a problem for my water. Um, one other item that got brought up was uh, the engineer here is saying that, uh, well, we can take the runoff water and we can just push it out back. Well, if you look at my property here, back of my property is out back too. So if he's going to push water out there, he's going to push water in my backyard, which I own, which isn't conservation land or anything else. It's part of my property. So I'm concerned with this plan that... <coughs> that uh, runoff is going to land up in my backyard. It's already wetland out there. Uh, I, all I have to do is walk off my lawn in the back of my house, which isn't that far back, and I step in water. And for the most part, that whole land area back out there is all wetland. You better wear a pair of boots on there if you go out and walk. Um, so if the residential farm zoning stayed, and somebody wanted to build, they could do exactly what happened on my lot, which is send it back, uh, however many feet that is. And nobody's going to build on the back of that land. It's just way too wet. You have to come in and fill. Um, so anyway, it doesn't sound good to me. Thank you, Mr. Whip. I'm Cindy Heelan, and I live on the other side of this proposed development. I also submitted a letter to you. A um, couple of things that I just wanted to reiterate that others have said. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in the four miles that this road travels from the, its inception in the beginning of Gorham to where it ends up in, Scar in Saco, um, there isn't one house on this road that has less than a 200-foot frontage, and we're proposing five houses crammed right in a row in a 600-foot area that's completely going to change the whole feel of our rural area. Additionally, all of our houses on this road, there is not one that has a less than 50-foot setback from the road. So I think that that's going to really make a huge impact on the feel of the neighborhood, the home values that other people have already spoken about. and. Um, I think that needs to be a huge consideration. My other concern, as Mr. Whipples, is the drainage issue. My land is very sandy, the part that's not wetlands, and um, I'm concerned because I already tend to get water in my basement when we have a heavy rain. So if they're going to elevate that lot that's right next to mine um, and not provide proper drainage, they're going to drain right into my basement or also into my back back of my lot. So I see some major problems. And one thing I, I really don't understand that I, I hope that somebody can address is how you can call putting five homes on a through road like this, call that a subdivision. I mean, I realize you're subdividing land, but to me, you're not you don't have a back road, you know, a side road like Dunn Estates is one of our neighborhood subdivisions that's extremely well done. You know, nobody could go in there and have any complaint on how that was done. But to put five houses in a row on an existing road with that's already a neighborhood, I don't understand how that can qualify just because somebody wants to put more houses than what really the land allows for, how they can get away with doing that, you know, and those wetlands are, you know, like somebody else said, they're, they're not usable. That, that land out there is not buildable for anything, so it just, you know, really doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and I, I'd like somebody, if they could, to explain that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Healan. Anyone else?
All right, seeing none, uh, turn it over to the board and ask Nick, would you like to start us? I would, um, you know, being allowed to do something and um, being allowed to do something is different than making sure it's the wise thing to do. Um, and they kind of look at this and um, it, it is out of um, character with the rest of the, the street and the neighborhood to have smaller lots. I would agree to that extent. Um, as far as what I'm seeing here on the plans, I think the the obvious the obvious ones which usually our chair is so good at picking up on is the looks like the wetlands are, are going into private lots as it's currently situated and you made some alterations is that yeah the the wetland will not be part of the lots we've well, we've um, misunderstood the 25 foot setback so that that'll be that'll be corrected right. there's just a couple of encroachments but we have the area and space to to move those up Sure. No, I, I just said those lot lines will be adjusted so there will not be any wetlands on the lots. Um, and then I'll, I'll ask the uh, access road question. Um, what is that? Pre My name is Joe Fustacci. I'm the developer, the owner of the property. The previous owner retained that land to access the um, his land that is on the other side of the CMP power lines. So he may be thinking about building a house back there. Um, it's not something that he discussed with me, the usage of the land, but um, he's just retained that as a possible access to the, to the property and back. Nick, could I? Yeah. I just point of, <coughs> excuse me, point of clarification. Um, Mr. Fasashi, you just mentioned that that right away was actually retained by the previous oh, owner. Previous owner. So on your plan, it says proposed right o proposed easement. I can't remember what the verbiage is, but is it proposed, proposed, proposed easement. easement. But it's an actual easement. Yeah, it is an actual easement. At this and point. so that area does it need is. to be. It's proposed. The proposed. It's a proposed easement. So it's not a. It, I guess the distinction is important for the net residential calculation to, to one of the questions that came up previously, how... I own the land. You own the land. I okay. own the land, yes. So, um, yeah, so I guess that's an important designation because if it's not a current right away, then it doesn't need to be subtracted out of the net res. No, it's not it? a current right okay. away. Okay. No. No. The... Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll keep barking up that tree real quick. Um, if you subtract it out, that easement from your calculations, do you lose a lot? We don't need to subtract it out because it's not existing. It's only existing easements and right of ways that have to be subtracted out. That's a proposed access easement. Uh, he might want to go out there on foot, cut trees. We, we don't know, but it'll be owned by the applicant and just a, an access easement across it. So it's not an existing easement that does not apply. Okay. Uh, outside of that, I think I've said what I need to say on this. Um, you know, that that is a fast road. Uh, can be fast. So I have concerns about sticking that many driveways in such a short span of space there. That would that, those would be my final thoughts. Thank you, Abe. Thank you. <coughs> I guess I'll be looking forward to seeing what you come up with with uh, plans for dealing with the drainage, uh, the drainage issues. Besides that, I, I really don't have any questions regarding the subdivision. <coughs> uh, I do have a few comments for those who, who did get up and speak. Uh, I'm not being judgmental. <coughs> uh, but I myself went through a similar situation 10 years ago when I built my house at the end of a dead end street with a large gravel pit beyond me. <clears throat> and it's been great for 10 years. But now there's six more house lots beyond me. Uh, and it's a similar uh, conservation uh, subdivision. Uh, but I knew it was coming. Uh, <clears throat> this is not Fort Kent or Jackman, Maine, 
where growth is very slow. It's Scarborough, Maine, which has been one of the fastest growing towns in the state of Maine. Uh, and if you live here or move here, you almost have to expect growth everywhere. And uh, conservation subdivisions are legal. Uh, they're part of the uh, subdivision process that's allowed here in Scarborough. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, how best to deal with it, I don't know. In my case, uh, I guess mentally I prepared myself for it, and I've learned to, to live with it. Uh, that's not to say that <clears throat> this board will approve this subdivision as is, as proposed. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, again, I just, you know, I just wanted to put those comments out for you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Corey? Thanks. Uh, well, as Nick said, I, I look forward as well to um, seeing details of the proposed uh, stormwater plan. Um, uh, this uh, reminds me a little bit of a, another conservation subdivision project that we, uh, that we looked at recently over the last few months where we potentially got some drainage issues and very flat area and, um, you know, and there's that little natural grade. It doesn't take much for things to go wrong. Um, so I'll be I'll be looking closely at that. Um, I think uh, the comments we just heard are, are well taken. Um, that said, I will say it is, at least in my experience, pretty uh, pretty unusual uh, to have a new subdivision with this many lots going on to. Uh, it's a, sort of a feeder, I don't know how it would technically be classified, uh, sort of a feeder road, um, which does have commuters and people driving at relatively high rates of speed. Um, and I, you know, I think in addition to ensuring that the, the applications that we see or the, the projects that we see end up conforming with, with the, the ordinances, we do have to look closely and take uh, into consideration safety concerns, and so that's one that I definitely have right out of the gate. Um, and uh, staff mentioned during the introduction that uh, we might be well advised to think about the appropriateness of removing vegetation in order to ensure sight lines and sight distances given this rural character here, and so that's something that I may be somewhat concerned about as well. Um, so I think, you know, this, We've talked about this before in a general way as a board that, um, you know, the good news is that with the economy picking up, we're seeing a lot more housing projects coming in front of us than we did over the previous few years. But a lot of the low-hanging fruit in Scarborough has already been picked, and so we're, we're really seeing a lot of these projects where uh, developers uh, with, you know, well within, well within the, uh, their rights under the under the ordinance and under subdivision regulations, are really trying to, in some cases, it feels like shoehorn uh, parcels into some very challenging areas, some very challenging sites. And so I, I think personally, we just have to re have to be really careful about how we review these. Um, and uh, so I, I guess just to circle back, I. I'm concerned about the, the water and the, uh, the traffic safety, and I'll look forward to seeing this flushed out. Thank Thanks, you. Corey. John? I kind of agree with Nick. Just because we can, it's allowed, uh, doesn't mean we have to do this. Uh, looking at these plans, too, this little sketch, uh, if you take the wetlands out of this, those lots are going to be very small compared to what we're showing on this map. So to me, it's just too much in one little area. I know it requires it. But we'll, look, we'll move forward and look at it and make sure we address the neighbor's concern. They have to be built as best we can. Right. And we certainly want to see some details the next time on the elevations. <coughs> and some information as far as that curve. That's all I've got right now. Thank you, John. Ron? 
Yeah, I'm just going to sort of reiterate without going into great dissertation here. On, on the good news, uh, I, in theory, it fits on the conservation subdivision. So in that regard, it does fit. Uh, having said that, I have uh, the same concerns, and I'll be watching very closely. Uh, and as was stated, we've had a couple of situations that came before us previously about flatland and water. And uh, I'm going to be cl watching closely the drainage issue because I can go either way with that. And I have a lot of empathy uh, for the neighboring land to make sure that they are not impacted any way by the new development. Uh, as far as drainage is concerned, I would like to hear about as you come back, the separation of the wells and the septic systems and make sure it does not run off in, on any neighbor's uh, land. Um, I want to hear a lot more about the open space because I haven't heard anything. And one thing we touched upon that I want to emphasize, I would like to see a traffic study done. Uh, it may not be quantity per se, but quality. Uh, and I'd like to hear from a traffic peer as to their opinion of, of putting five houses on, on that small area with a 35 mile an hour, uh, uh, miles per hour. Uh, and um, I want to hear a lot more about the wetland also. Um, and uh, I'd be curious to hear, uh, I don't know if this is within the prerogative of our committee, what these houses are intended to be sold for. Um, because it does have an impact on the other houses as far as the value is concerned. And I know that a lot of that is arbitrary, but I'd still like to hear what these houses, uh, what the intent is for, to sell them for. Um, and that's about it for the moment. I guess I'm just reiterating what my fellow board members have said in a different sort of way. All right. Thank you, Ron. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm all over the place on this one. Uh, the first thing is, is I really think that we're almost even premature discussing this this evening from the standpoint that um, while I am not a, an engineer, um, at least of this sort, I still am not convinced that we have a conventional plan that has four buildable 80,000 square foot lots on it, five. or five, excuse me. Um, and so I need to be able to see that that is in fact the case um, before I want to consider this as a conservation subdivision. So if we can't uh, reasonably see how we would build five homes on 80,000 square foot lots that uh, still have uh, buildable um, spaces, then, uh, you know, I, I appreciate what you got there, Bill, but we haven't had a chance to review it. So, yeah, no, I, I, I understand. But it, has, it hasn't been reviewed yet. Um, so until we really f know sure. that we've got that, we may not be talking five. We might be talking four. I, I don't know. We, we've got to <coughs> see what's in front of us in terms of that. Um, so that, that's first. So it's, like I say, it's almost a little premature to be looking at the other plan until we know what we've got to work with. Um, in um, terms of stormwater management, I think that's fairly simple. We can look to make sure that we're not going to impact the abutters on that and, and make sure that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the grading and stuff of any new lots that go in uh, do not cause water problems. I think that's, we can probably make that happen. Um, while I appreciate there is um, no clear understanding of what the easement is at this point in time, and there probably can't be, um, it is certainly something of concern uh, from my perspective that we see if there's any way that we can get our arms around that. I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with that at this point. Um, as my fellow board members have said, this does in fact 
meet the black and white of what a sub conservation subdivision could look like. Uh, so when, while the public may not fully understand that, I appreciate that, but I mean we're not out of the bounds or the applicant is certainly not out of the bounds of what he is trying to represent or do here. Um, and in, I'm just trying to answer some of the questions that I heard come up. Placement of septic systems and stuff, we can make sure that that works. Um, and the last question that I had written down that I wanted to make sure that I answered is um, one of the comments had to do with how can wetlands be part of the calculation. And in reality, wetlands is part of any calculation of any lot. In fact, there are lots on this plan right now where part of the 80,000 square feet for the property is actually wetlands. So it's, again, that piece of it is very common uh, in terms of being part of the calculations. But then again, we also look at what is buildable, what is not buildable. Um, when we try to do the evaluation on the conventional plan, which is what I haven't been convinced yet, um, that is possible to allow for five lots. So as I look at this, there is a fair amount of area here that is wetland, and uh, we need to make sure that a conventional um, plan could be done for five properties before we proceed. So um, obviously we get some, um, and again, this is prelim, which is why we do this. Sure. Um, and I think that my fellow board members have made good comments in, re in regards to um, some of the traffic issues. I'd like to get a little bit more information, Bill, if I could, on what would come down in terms of um, road site. Um, what are we going to remove? In other words, okay. what kind of, are we talking, you know, brush? Are we talking, you know, six inch trees? What, what are we talking about that needs to be removed for sight line um, in this area in order to get what the traffic folks feel that they need okay. to provide good sight line views for, uh, for this area? So I think we need to do that as well to get a little bit better understanding of what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, if that continues to be a real concern, then maybe we do a road trip, which is another possibility. Oh, yep. Yep. Great. So um, I think that's fine. Yeah. You know. Okay. But let's get moving and let's find out what we can build and let's keep going. Yes, Nick. I don't know if he has clarification. If he's clear on whether or not he needs a traffic study, I, I think Ron's the only one that mentioned some direction as to possibly gaining a waiver on on that. I don't know. I don't know how the board feels. I, I don't think. I don't. I don't want it to be a waiver. That's what I said. I, yeah, but you're the only one that's commented yeah. on it, and I don't know if he has any other how the rest of the board felt about it. I'd like to hear from the traffic group here, like Bill Bray, uh, what well, his feelings Bill Bray about. has weighed in, is that correct? Yeah. Bill Bray did, <clears throat> he didn't do a traffic study. Okay. What I asked Bill Bray to do was, um, one, work on the traffic impact fee analysis. Mm -hmm. And two, I asked him to take a quick visit out to the site just to take a look quickly at sight lines. That's, that's all he's looked at. Okay. It, it really wasn't a traffic report. Um, it really was focused on those two. So I think, you know, if, if the board has concerns with traffic that weren't addressed in Bill Bray's memo, which again was very minimal because um, the applicant asked for the waiver, staff didn't want to go too far if the board was going to be comfortable with the waiver. Um, but if you're seeking more information, then that would be on the applicant to provide, which then the town engineer, traffic engineer would review. Um, but we wouldn't generate the report. That's the applicant's responsibility to provide the evidence if the board feels additional evidence is necessary. Do we go to Mr. Bray because the applicant may use our normal peer traffic reviewer? I went to Mr. Bray because he is our our first traffic engineer, peer review okay. engineer. He's right. first yep. on our list. Tom Gorrell, second on our list. Okay. Um, so yep. I went to Mr. Bray because he's our 
first. first. He's our go-to. All right, gotcha. And I said, at a minimum, we know we're going to need to know impacts, traffic impacts. Yep. So why don't we get that out of the way? And if the board's comfortable with that, wonderful. If they're not, then the yeah, applicant will need to do more due diligence. I, you know, I think in terms of traffic study, we're talking about turn counts and all of those other things. I mean, I mean, this is a this is homes, right? So I mean, I don't. That's pretty standard stuff. I'm not overly concerned about that as much as I am line of sight, right? Type information. Right. I mean, me personally. But I'm also concerned because it was mentioned earlier that this is a little bit unusual that we have cars coming right out into a 35 mile an hour zone in a subdivision. Uh, am I wrong or, or in that respect? And and I'd like to hear from a traffic, you know, engineer who knows a heck of a lot more than I will. Don't you know. drive down Black Point Road every day, Ron? I mean, I'm not... 50, I, I, 50 times a day. But, okay, but I mean, so my point is that's 35 mile an hour road and is... No, There's driveways along that road on both sides for yeah, as far as I can uh, see. True, true, true. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm not overly concerned about that. Again, me personally now, I can't speak for everybody else, but there are houses that enter 35 mile an hour roads all over this town. Yeah, you make a good point. I, I, I stand on that one. Thank you. So it's, you know, it's, do we have the enough line of sight to enter the road safely is the real question in my I mind. I agree. I agree. So if we can get that information, I, I would be satisfied with that um, I, I, because I think the rest is it happens all over town every day. So I agree. I will say, though, that this is a rural farming district where there's a, there's a pre-existing travel pattern that does not is where we you don't have this level, and I'm not I'm not a I don't have any issue with density per se certainly, but this is a this would be a market change, and again we're only talking about five units, but we're we're talking about five houses that in a in a in an area that is rural in character, you're going to have these five okay. back together. So I, that said, I do agree with you that I know this rises to the level of a traffic study because as you said you're getting into things about you know accidents at intersections and things like that that's typically what you see in those so I do think this is ultimately a line of sight and factoring in hopefully you know real rates of speed and yeah. establishing whether those thresholds are met we One can provide that and submit it to you, and then it can go to Bill Bray for peer review. Yeah, I, okay. it, I mean, from I my perspective, yeah. I yep. do the due diligence that we need to do without getting into a full-blown traffic study where we're going to be looking at intersections two miles away. Right. Doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll look at those uh, issues you just talked about. Okay. Thank you. Also, just mentioned that the applicant has also in their application uh, requested a waiver of a nitrate plume analysis. I heard a number of board members sort of suggest that you had concern, potential concerns with location of septics and wells. Um, and so I, I was sort of reading that to mean um, you weren't interested in that waiver, but I think it's important that we have that discussion so that it's clear for the applicant what the expectation is. Given the amount of wetland that's in this area, and given the, I'll call it lack of grade change, elevation change, I think that we need to have that analysis completed. My opinion. I agree. agree. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Any other direction that we need to provide the applicant that you're aware of, Jay? No, I'm aware of our panel. No, I think you've else? covered it. We, we realize we've got work to do, and the purpose was to get comments back like we did. So appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Great, thanks. Mr. Chair, if I could yes. just take a, a moment for uh, those that are interested in the public. Um, the town standard in our ordinance, we notify the public the first time an item comes before us. We don't send out additional notifications. 
Um, I'll note that we do post our agenda on the town's website. This board meets every three weeks. The agenda is usually posted 10 days before the meeting or so. Um, so if you sort of regularly check the planning board's webpage or the uh, planning department's webpage, you can get a link to the agenda. You can always send me a quick email every few weeks and say, hey, what's going on? And I can try to provide a quick email response as well. But um, just want to give you a heads up. If I could add to that, it is our policy to provide an opportunity, which was this evening, for public comment. That is not to say that if there is adequate interest that another opportunity may not, might present itself, all right? Um, so I guess not, not to be confusing, but you may not get an opportunity to talk at every meeting, but certainly if there's enough interest in the project, this board generally allows for a second opportunity for public comment before we do final approvals. And again, it's, it's usually determined by interest of the public, right? It's not a requirement, but we do try to do that um, to give um, the townspeople a chance to voice their opinion. So please watch for uh, announcements coming and we'll go from there. And on the agenda, by the way, if you see a little tiny asterisk at the end of the item, that's, that's an indication that public comment will in fact be taken that evening. <coughs> okay? Great. Um, again, item number seven has been tabled. We'll move to item number eight, Scarborough Holdings, Scarborough, Scarborough Property Holdings, LLC. Request a site plan amendment review for a previously approved site at 284 Payne Road. Mr. Chase. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. As uh, board members, most board members, I believe, will recall, the site was approved in April of 2013. It was a multi-use site of which one of the two lots has been developed at this point. It's the gas station right at the corner of Higgis, and, uh, Higgis Parkway and Payne Road. Um, during staff site inspection prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, which we typically or always do for site plan, uh, for, uh, site plan approvals, it was discovered that a number of items on the site were out of compliance with the approved plans that were on file. Um, we brought that to the uh, developer's attention and they are here before the board for uh, seeking, I believe it's five uh, discrete site plan modifications or I should say distinct uh, modifications. Um, as, as noted, uh, you know, when this site went through approval, it was reviewed under the site plan review and design standards. I think most of the items we talk about really sort of um, align with sort of what the design standards speak to for the most part. Um, and I'll just run through them quickly and I can uh, speak to them in further depth if board members have questions. Uh, the first item the applicant is seeking is to modify the uh, approved dumpster pad screening. It was approved with a wood fence. They're proposing a chain link fence with vinyl slats. Uh, there's been an addition of a car wash pay kiosk behind the building and as you uh, approach the car wash, um, that's been added and that wasn't shown on the approved site plan. Uh, there was the installation of uh, vacuum equipment with uh, associated vinyl fencing, uh, sort of in front, basically between the existing um, vacuum stations and the car wash. Uh, there was uh, mechanical equipment that was moved from the rooftop of the, or the, I, sh I guess I should say the back roof of the approved uh, structure to being ground mounted and that thusly there's a different building that was built than was previously approved. Um, ostensibly the front remains the same, but there are certainly modifications. And the last item is uh, for addition of um, essentially uh, messages on the, on the uh, freestanding sign. They're looking to add panels that say car wash and beer cave. Our design standards speak to uh, that really being uh, a planning board uh, type item to permit those and staff didn't feel comfortable approving those panels uh, without the boards weighing in. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chase. Uh, I do want the board to know a couple of things uh, before we turn this over to the applicant. First thing is, is uh, 
the chair was approached to approve these administratively. I opted not to. I thought the changes were too significant to do an approval on my own, and I wanted the entire board to sit uh, on these changes. And number two, I'm going to do something a little bit different with the approval process on these five items this evening because they are truly five individual distinct items in front of us. And when we go to take any action on whether we approve or not approve these items, I am going to vote on them individually. So be thinking in terms of that uh, as you um, consider the items in front of us and uh, questions you may or may not want to ask in regard to those items. So I will address them individually at the end of discussion. With that, I will turn it over to the applicant. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, David LaTulip uh, with Scarborough Property Holdings. Also with me is Wes Thames, our VP of Construction. Uh, we're happy to be in Scarborough. The store looks great. We're getting great responses from the community and from the customers on how it looks and feels and laying out. So we're happy to be here. Uh, I'll cut to the chase on one of Ron's first questions. No, we haven't finished the deal with Panera Bread. <laughs> Uh, the word we're getting back from them is their market study came out a little too good and we don't have enough parking for them. Uh, and they don't want to have a similar situation that they have in South Portland where there's just not enough place for their customers to park. So that's the update on the second lot. Um, I'll go by the items one by one. Uh, the change was made at the request, and we probably should have come to the board, we just never read that deep into the design standards. Uh, what the uh, tenant has found on several locations on the dumpster enclosure is that the wood fences, in particular the gates, aren't holding up. Uh, they just, they, the mechanisms, because they get opened at least once a day some, or several times a week, they're just not holding up and they just look really poor within six, eight months. So what they prefer to do was the chain link because it's a little lighter weight and it's easy to open and close. So we do have some flexibility to, to add some wood, but the big component that they were looking for is the gate mechanism because on several locations that are less than a couple of years old, uh, that detail just wasn't holding up. So they had made that change in, um, on that one. Uh, the other one on the pay kiosk was just something that we forgot to show on the existing plan. Uh, we do need it because we want them to pay for the car wash, uh, but it's just a small little stanchion as you come into the uh, uh, the car wash area, and we forgot to show that on the final plan when we came in for the revision. Uh, third item is the vacuum equipment. Uh, what we did that is it's a central uh, vacuum system as opposed to having individual containers <coughs> on each island. So we put it in, in the corner of the building and we shielded it, what we thought was a very attractive and consistent with other what we've done in the back to screen, uh, a nice vinyl fence which flows right in with the uh, decor of the building. And, and that's consistent with the design standards to screen any sort of mechanical equipment. Um, the fourth item was the HVAC system. Uh, that was an error on our part. We showed the HVAC system, uh, th those components, on the approved site plan. We just didn't upgrade the building elevation to show that that was removed. We think it's a much better solution. Uh, now you have just a shingled roof uh, with no equipment and no fencing to, to cover that. It's all uh, hidden behind the building, so it gave us a much more appealing roof line, especially where we have access coming from the back of the building. Uh, the third, uh, the l final item was on the monument sign. Uh, the original sign that we proposed was more of a traditional pylon sign. Uh, we switched that and we're very pleased that it's a much more attractive looking sign with a monument with the brick base. And what the tenant has, uh, what we're looking to do is, uh, we feel that the, the one panel in particular, the car wash, is a, a distinct uh, service that we're providing on the property. There's not this car wash doesn't have a particular name. It's not a logo, but it is a service that is about a third of the property. Uh, so that's very important. The other one was Beer Cave. On the original plan, we had Power Engineering. Uh, they switched that to Beer Cave. It's not a logo. 
It doesn't say Budweiser. It doesn't say Coors. It just tells the customer that this is a component within uh, the store. So it's not a, a logo per se. It's just uh, um, added. By, and we're not increasing. We're all within the square footage of the signage, so everything meets the, the code. Uh, so I'd um, like to get your input on these five items. Thank you. Um, let's start with the dumpster screening. I'm just kind of going down through the list as uh, Jay described them. Can I make a general point? comment? You absolutely can. First of all, the building does look great. And uh, I'm glad to hear that it's received uh, positive input. However, I'm a little perturbed. I hear your excuses, and I'm sure that they're, they're well-based, but we sit here every third week and have people come in front of us, and we approve things, or disapprove. And we've had much bigger projects than that come and ask for exceptions. Mm -hmm. And and I, have, I am really irritated, to be honest with you, that these five, and I can see where the chair took the position that he wanted this to come before the full board, and I'm glad he did. Uh, you know, that it was arbitrary. You did it without any permission whatsoever from this board. Uh, and that's our function. And uh, um, I, I will think each, about each of the situations that are in front of us, but I'm not a happy camper. No. And I apologize for that. There was a disconnect during construction when we switched uh, tenants and they had different standards, and we should have looked closer at the design standards. I fully understand. Thank you. So, um, again, and part of the reason why I, want, I didn't want to look at this as a group, because I felt that they should each stand on their own merit at this point. I, I agree with that. And, um, you know, so that we can discuss them accordingly. I don't know if there's anybody who would like to start, or I can break tradition, and I can start if you want, on the dumpster. Um, my personal feeling is what's there is not good enough. Um, when I look and see, for example, what they did when they screened the vacuum equipment, that is way more acceptable um, in terms of what this property should look like. And I might add, when you enter this pro property from um, Gibson Road, you immediately see this dump situation, immediately. And from, from my perspective, um, I have also seen wooden structures that have similar hardware to what you see, <coughs> although they're covered by wood and they're not just chain link with a little bit of vinyl in the middle of it. Um, Clearly, our ordinance talks about a totally different kind of dumpster enclosure than what we're looking at here. And I think this is one of those items that can um, be handled differently. I don't like it. And I think we need to see something a little bit different on it uh, before, we should, um, before we should accept it. Those are my comments. Chair, I agree. Um, I was also thinking along the lines of, uh, you know, maybe having metal gate hardware but a wooden face on, on the gates. And I agree with you that it's these are visible. And, and in, in a way, because the the rest of the property, the rest of the building looks so good, um, it stands out all the more. And it's it's uh, kind of unfortunate. So I. Say that's where I'm on that one as well. Yeah, and, and, and again, not that I know for a fact you can do it, but if you look at the second page where they screen the vacuum equipment, the second picture that they provided, 
uh, with the vinyl fence. Um, I gotta believe they can do something similar to that with the dumpster area, with some kind of a gate. And so whether it's wood or whether it's a nice vinyl fencing similar to what they've got here, either of those would be acceptable to me. But what I'm seeing right now is not. I would point out that there's a vinyl fence right behind it already, and I think for consistency purposes, I would I would hate to see a wood fence go up next to the vinyl that we're seeing everywhere else. Exactly. No, that's a good, good point, Nick. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, there is a vinyl fence right behind it, attached to the building. Yeah. Dave? Regardless of what material you use, I think the key here is uh, to reinforce the doors so they hold up maybe... Um, additional hinges, you know, might do the trick. Okay. I agree with the vinyl, and I'd like to see it six foot tall. I don't think that's six foot now. It, it, excuse me, Mr. Chair, West Thames. I, since I built some of this, I might as well press the board. <laughs> um, the fence that's there now is a six foot chain link, um, but it can be skin off, and we can replace the material with other material. Um, the vinyl, though, I, I hate to say it, the vinyl would be more apt to be, I mean, you just thump vinyl and you could have a hole. It's just like a vinyl side and it's a hollow tube. Um, if I got to build it out of something other than chain length, I'd rather go with the wood because it's going to last. But, I mean, it's up to you. I can do the white wood. You, you I, I just don't. A Azac I, has an appearance of a. Well, vinyl. I could I could do Azac. I'm just saying is I just don't think vinyl is the answer for the chain link fence. I, I, I'm just looking for something that has a similar look and feel. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think what we'll do is the board approved a fence. We'll go back to that detail, explain that to our tenant, and saying this is what was approved. This is what we're going to build. So we'll just take that right off the table. I apologize. We were okay. listening to, trying to be responsive to our tenant who was having some maintenance issues. So, uh, if uh, if I may go to the next step, if the board is comfortable, if the applicant wants to submit something to staff, is the board comfortable with me doing an administrative approval on that item? Yes. Should it come to us so that the applicant doesn't have to come back again? Yes. We might. And we could. We, yeah, all right. <laughs> and, and so we can help the applicant move yeah. a little faster. Yes. Okay. I think given that we've had this conversation, I think, yeah. we're all kind of on. Everybody's kind of on the same page, and I work with Jay, and we'll I come up with something. The sentiment that, of. Yeah. Yeah. We understand. Okay. <laughs> but I just want to also make sure that this, since we're having this discussion, I want to take it to the next level with the board, so that we can not hold the applicant hostage, if you will, time-wise to get to another meeting. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable That's all I'm that. suggesting. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on, not take action, if you will, on the dumpster at this time. Item number two, car wash kiosk. Comments? John? I move for approval. You move for approval. Okay. okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. We have a second so we can discuss. Any discussion? From anybody? I've got to make a comment. We don't have a lot of choice, do we? Okay. Having said that, <laughs> I mean, this is the problem with coming to us after yeah, the fact. We, we understand. It, it, it really puts this board in a difficult spot. Um, so, <clears throat> All right. Very simple, easy motion. All in favor of improving the car wash kiosk as installed. All in favor? Okay. I see that to be approved. Next item. Vacuum equipment, vacuum equipment addition. Next item is the... Uh Vinyl fence. Yeah, they, oh. they sort of go. They sort of go hand in hand. There's the. Uh, the I, I phrased it as vinyl fence around the vacuum okay. Okay. equipment. Yeah. They framed it as vacuum equipment with vinyl fence around it. Right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. But again, that's that's the item I believe that is shown yes. in the second picture that was given to us. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Do you get that, Ron? Yeah. All right. Um, that at least I believe to be attractive, and I'm okay with that particular item, personally. I've got no issue with it. Okay. You want me to make a motion? That would be awesome. <laughs> I move for approval. We move for approval of the final fence. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you very much, Corey. Any discussion on that item? Seeing none. All in favor of that one? I show that to be approved. All right. Um, this is a discussion regarding the building, physical building change that was made and the movement of the mechanical equipment from the roof of the building down to the ground. I just want to clarify, we did show the equipment on the approved site plan. We just didn't, the architect didn't revise his building elevations to show that it had been removed on the final version of the site plan. Okay. So that was where the disconnect <coughs> happened. Uh, but they were on the approved site plan, and that's where they're located. We have them in two locations. Yeah, I was just looking at what I've got here for a site plan in front of me to see if I can identify it. Back here. Back there, okay. Yep. It's really just behind where the dumpster was, as we yeah. talked about. Yep. That's really the vinyl fencing you were looking at. Exactly. Is those gotcha. mechanical pads. So, as they just described on the site plan that we have, it shows a mechanical pad on the on the ground. Right. The architecture we have shows a mechanical pad in the roof line on okay. the back of the building. So, okay. really, this is more of a discussion of the roof line of the structure than it is mechanical pads. Yeah. I guess if we think of it in that terms. Okay. Uh, again, jumping ahead here, improvement to the dumpster, I think, is going to make the most visual impact, and I don't think that this is going to be an issue, personally. It isn't with me. All right. I don't know if anybody else discussion, although we're jumping ahead here without a motion, but... Um, do I need to do that again? <laughs> I move to approve it. There we go. All right. Do we have a second? Mr. Mazur, thank you. All right. Um, keeping everything on, on the up and up here. So any other discussion on this item? All in favor? I show that. Unanimous as well. Final item is the messaging on the signage. Question for the staff. Yes. Is it out of conformity? The, the, the sign? Yes. It's, no, what the, what the design standards say, and I'll, I'll, I'll read the quote here, is the use of sponsor logos, slogans, or other messages on a tenant sign to promote products or services other than the primary tenant is strongly discouraged. So it's a discouraging. It's not a pro, prohib, prohibition, um, like you know the uh, chain link fence with the vinyl flats. That says prohibited. This says discouraged. Um, and so it's really uh, to the board. And, and the way we interpret the car wash beer cave is that that is a other message on a tenant sign to promote a product or service other than the primary tenant. The primary tenant is the Dunkin' Donuts. It is the Sebago Cafe. It is the Irving. Those are sort of the primary. So again, this, this leaves it at the you know, state's discouraged. So that's, that's the, the bigger issue for us really is the car wash. That's we spent over a million dollars so we could say it's incidental, but it was a million dollars. And it is behind the trees. So when you get off the exit, you don't really see the building or what it is. So that, for us, we don't <coughs> consider that a logo. We feel that as, and and how the zoning what interpreted it as an accessory use, we feel, and the tenant feels pretty strongly on that one, on the car wash. The I don't field, have any problem with the car wash. I really don't. I don't either. I don't either. I, I almost see that as a sort of a pseudo tenant, if you will. It's kind of a separate building. Um, it's not a Who came up with the beer cave? 
It's something, when we switched over to Irving, that's what they're, that's how they message it and they have it in other areas. Uh, reading on the design standard, it says up to 25% can be used for logos or messaging if the board so chooses. This would be closer to 5%, but I mean, Power wash is fine, in my mind. I mean, I, 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 that, because that's a service that's yeah. being. Beer Cave, mm, so that's not, a, that's not a code name for the pub? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> no, mm. it's, it's, it's a corner of, it, what it's basically what they're saying is one of the products that they serve, it, you can buy a case of beer and it's in a cooler versus just the stand-ups where you're, you're getting six packs. So that's the, that's the messaging that they're trying to get. I'm just... I mean, but everybody knows that that goes... Yeah, come the on now. The, the I'm okay with the car wash, not with the beer cake. I'm hearing this side make that comment. I haven't really heard. I'm fine with what the way it is. <clears throat> So you're okay with the way it I'm is? I'm okay with the beer cave. Nick? I'm okay with it. I'm Nick. okay with it. I mean, I, I mean, Irving, though, has got to, they can understand. they got to come before us if they want any acceptance. Uh, this one is one that we submitted for the building permit, which is the, the, the way, and that's what they requested. So this is our first time. The, that sign has not been installed. Those panels are blue. They have not been installed. No, the beer cave hasn't been installed. No, has not. No. So we're not. This is the one time I can say out of the four hide, I'm in the right. <laughs> They're in the right because it's on their sign permit, and we told them they couldn't have it. Right. <laughs> I would prefer it not be there. Yeah. I mean, right. I, I, I was so going to here's, go here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this a little easier on the board. I'm going to um, move that we approve car wash, but do not approve beer cave. Second. We have a second. Everybody understand the motion? Yes. All in favor? Opposed? <laughs> Four to one. All right. I'd like to make one more comment. Yeah. Uh, your next phase are going to be a lot more critical and a lot more observant of what's going on. Yeah. No, we. Uh, and I think Wes wants to address the, the board. Uh, I'll address the board, and I built it, and I totally apologize. I mean, some of the things I looked at as I looked at it a little bit differently. Um, I looked at some of the things as accessory to uses of it, and I shouldn't have. Totally apologize. I've been through this meeting with Jay, talking with Jay, learned my lesson, understand it well, and so, as I said, totally apologize. And I so, appreciate your you comments. Know, I really do. I'm a man. I can get up here and say, hey, I did it, and it won't happen again. So. All right, so. Thank you. My thank you. My understanding of what's going to happen next, you're going to submit to staff uh, I'm going to give you some elevation. A, a revised yeah. elevation of what the dumpster fencing will look like. We've gone through and approved the other four items with the exception of the verbiage beer cave. Correct. Everything else has gone through and have been passed. Bear cave sign won't go up, but Bear cave sign. <laughs> Don't want to see it. Okay. Yeah. Just one slight addition to that. Bring it on. There is an approved dumpster enclosure. If they choose to move forward with that, it will not cross your nose because it is a. it was prior approved for a wood fence that's on the approved plans. What they did was non-conforming, so what they were requesting was to keep <coughs> what they had built. So at this point, they do have an approved plan. They do have an approved wood, wood enclosure. So if they desire to go back to that, the board's already blessed that. So that's the only caveat to your first statement. Okay. Okay. It's okay with me because mm -hmm. it's already just, been approved. I would have to say, though, they changed the design, though, by, by adding in a vinyl over here and asking us for permission. Didn't they yeah. change the over, uh, overall outlook? Wouldn't that give us some leeway rather, you know, if the board wants to see what they're putting back, then I would, I would think you could, we could make that a condition of these approvals. There's no reason you couldn't send us an email and we've got a yeah. with it. Obviously. I, I don't have any problem submitting something to you to get approved. Yeah. Okay. No. 
as long as it nope. doesn't hold up my CO. You, you, you're, you're right. <laughs> you know, that if, you, if the board has concerns that based on the changes you've approved tonight, that you're concerned that the approved, prior approved fence detail or enclosure detail might not be well coordinated and you want to see that, that's, I would say, well within your I think purview. that would be my only comment, which yeah. is that, you know, at this point with what they've done, that they've just sought approval for, mm -hmm. it's changed what the overall outlook is. And if it had come to us in the condition where we saw a vinyl fence here and a wooden fence there, I think mm -hmm. this board probably would have said, what are you doing mixing two styles? Mm -hmm. That's all I'm pointing out. Okay. So what I'm hearing then is... They'll submit to us. They'll submit to us. And we'll take it from there. Well, but I thought we'd approve that you could do it with. Well, I, get, uh, again, I can. I, think, I, I can opt to approve or not approve. I would go with that. <laughs> I personally, I, I think Nick's point is well taken. But I, I am, I am happy to delegate that to you. Absolutely. Understood. No complaints. We'll take. We'll take a view of it. We'll take that into consideration before we do anything. If that item has to move to an administrative action, and where that brings us, it brings us. All right. Now, the only no. other thing that I request, I don't know if we need to m have any kind of a motion on this or not, but the one thing I would n want you to do is revise your site plan drawing to reflect the changes we've discussed this evening and approved. Actually, you have that now. The one the the plan that you've got with um, shows the key shows the uh, kiosk for okay. the car wash. I just want to make yeah. sure that yeah. whatever the site plan is that is approved yeah. is what we have on file in the planning. I'll, I'll bring J yeah, I'll bring Jay some updated full size, but he has that digitally okay. now. All right, that's I just. Want to make sure that we close that loop in terms of we got the paperwork. You. Yep. All right. Yep. So that's that's all I'm after there. Okay. Anything else? I'm good. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Item number nine: Town Planners Reports. Uh, sure. I have two items to report. Uh, just an update on uh, again going back probably four or five weeks at this point. We had a joint meeting with the council regarding uh, wireless cell, uh, um, uh, cell phone towers. Just to let the board know, the council will be holding a workshop on that item, uh, I believe, on October 9th, which I believe is Thursday, if I'm getting my dates right, which I believe I am. Um, the other item I want to update the board on, uh, again, another um, workshop we held, I think the week after the wireless um, workshop was on the Dunstan revitalization plan. Just let the board know that that plan was adopted by the council within the last couple weeks. Um, and we actually, uh, talking with Dan, um, and based on conversations we have with the board in the past about um, trying to uh, continue sort of our workshops that we had and ongoing dialogues with other boards uh, and committees in town, we thought that maybe the Dunstan Revitalization Plan might be a good opportunity to get together with the folks from SEDCO to talk about that plan and other things as well, but maybe that would be sort of a, a good starting off point um, for a workshop maybe in sometime we'd look in November. Um, so just want to get a general sense from the board if that sounds like something you may be interested in pursuing. Okay. I would say yes to that, okay. but I'm going to be going the whole month of November. Well, we'll try to find a date that works. <laughs> we can do a conference call. That's right. Uh, in the Asia? Sure. You pay the bill. That's what I have for a town planner's report. Thank you, Jay. Administrative amendment report. Yep. Uh, one <coughs> item to report, uh, Fielding's Oil down off uh, Mason Libby Road, which was approved about a year ago or so for some outdoor tanks, and then they were going to do a, uh, a garage. They've requested to expand the garage by an additional four feet. It's four more feet where it was going to be driveway, already paved area. It didn't impact any impervious area, really ostensibly didn't change anyone's purview of the site, um, so we reviewed that with the planning board chair, and that did receive administrative approval. Any other correspondence? Should have seen an email um, from 
and I think it's Eddie regarding Piper Shores. Yes. Um, I believe we provided copies of that. So oh, this one. You got hard copies. You have you have hard copies. Yes, I believe that came in today or yesterday, or recently anyway. So I just wanted to be sure. Sounds good. I'll call that. Just wanted to be sure that was <coughs> noted for the record. Okay. Planning board comments. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the drink workshop on the towers. What time is that going to be, Jay? Seven. 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 Yeah. On, on the 9th? On the 9th. And I know we had sort of a brief conversation, but I, I really think the board needs to re readdress that. I don't know what the legalities are of that, uh, the protocol and so forth, but I think there's been some dramatic changes to it so that it, I think input from this board based on those changes should be something that should be considered. Other comments? I have comments on that as well, so now is probably a good time. Um, first of all, I would love to see this come back to this board in terms of um, the board having another public hearing on this item. There's been significant enough changes to that. I believe that everybody should have received, did everybody receive it? I know I did received the revised language. Yeah, did, every, did everybody else get yeah. that? Dan yeah. sent that to the okay. entire board. Yep. I thought he did, but yep. just in case, I just yep. wanted to make sure. Uh, I would ask that everybody try to become familiar with that if you can. And the reason for that is this. Um, I would like to see this board hold a workshop, if you will, on this item that basically tries to get our arms around it like we have design standards, right? So we've got a design standard manual, uh, manual that says signage should look like this, construction should look like this, lighting should look like this, right? Well, I think we ought to do something very, very similar to cell towers in that document that helps this board and future boards to be able to understand what we are wrestling with and maybe put together a list of comments, questions, or whatever so that when a site comes to us, we know the right things to try to ask, to try to qualify. Because the, what's different about this What's really different about this is that the applicant is going to come to us and say, I, and, and not to be exact here, but there's like four different approaches that they can take when they want to add a tower. And it's like approach one, approach two, approach three, approach four, right? So as we're going through this, how do we know that approach one won't work? If that's our preferred item, right? If we say this is num we want you to do this in this order, number one, number two, number three, number four, in terms of how they want to expand the cell service, how do we know that they can't do one? We, how, they, how can they prove it? How, how can they prove it? So what do we need to know as a board, if you will, that says, number one, really, we don't think and we agree with the applicant that number one isn't a viable solution, so we should move to number two. I, I don't know if I was, having read that document, if I'm sitting here today and an applicant came, applicant came in front of us, I don't know how, how I'd make that decision right now. Good point. So I think that we need to kind of try to see if we can get our arms around this and, and come up with our own concerns and put it down in a standard, if you will, or a policy that will not only help this board make those decisions, but will also help the applicant understand what we're going to be looking for for information so that we can make the intelligent choice. Having said all of that, we're really good, smart guys, but staff, we're going to need you big time to help us with this. All right? So I, I just think that we need to do something to try to help manage this process moving forward. This is very controversial in the town. Right. Get, you know, people get pretty excited about it, and I can understand that. Um, 
you know, some people want to drive the revenue by having a tower in their backyard because it's it's a great revenue generator, right? That same token. Not so much for all of their neighbors, right? So, you know, we just we have to try to figure out how do we make heads and tails out of it because the onus in the way that this current chain <coughs> is written is all on this board to enforce. You read it. We own it. Yep. To why I made the measure. You said so, you're, you're well spoken, Mr. Chair. Well spoken. So we just we should do something to help ourselves understand this process and hopefully get it right more often than not. Those are my comments on that item. Any other comments? We need a good cell tower consultant. You fit like a traffic consultant. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's one of the challenges. Not only is it controversial, but it's uh, there's a real uh, there's an asymmetry of information. You know that you've got you've got one that the applicant comes in and they've got all their technical information and, and they are sort of accustomed to approaching things in a certain way and, um, and they've got the statutes that they're citing and, and it's just it's a different animal from what we're accustomed to. And I think we need, I agree with you, we need to well, arm ourselves so that we can... Yeah, the town had a consultant a, to do the initial study, advantage. right? Yeah. They did work with a professional, yes, yeah. So I don't know if that's something that we can do like we do peer engineers. Can we build in a process that would provide a professional consultant of some town or some kind that the town would hire that the applicant would need to uh, pay, mm -hmm. lack of a better term. That's what right? they do. It's what they do. The other applicants do that. So maybe we need to have that consultant. And one, one potential advantage of that is that it's <coughs> going to be a moving target. So you know, we can sort of establish guidelines, but the technology is going to continue to change. So daily, we've got to be able to, we you know, have to be able to keep up with it. Speaking of that, and I don't want to get off the beaten track, but all the phone companies now are going to Wi-Fi for calling, and I don't know how that impacts all of this because I'm not versed enough, but right. that's the direction. So what you're saying, I think, and what I'm saying, reinforces the whole need for what you just... Yeah. So maybe, you know, somehow maybe in our, again, policy, design standard, however we want to, uh, you know, name this thing. So I didn't write it, basically, like giving the same criteria that Dan was talking about, just different possibilities, not that we want this type of system in this area of town. Right. I don't just want to see that sort of language. We've got all these neighbors that are opposed to cell towers in a residential neighborhood. There's no reason we can't do demand that they put that DAC system in, like yeah. they have in Nantucket. Because they're banning all new cell towers, but they still have plenty of cell service by demanding we put that system in. It's expensive. But they're making money. Yeah. I think that would be my only other comment, which is that, you know, is there a way for us to research, you know, have a case study of another town that's gone through this? We're not the first town to have to go through this and, and kind of see what other ordinances have been put in place by another community and what the results are. It's always, it's always nice to see somebody else be the guinea pig and, and kind of dissect the, uh, the results. I mean, there's got to be a town out there that's done this. <laughs> Several, I imagine. I think all good reasons to uh, suggest that the planning board wants to see we this will, item before we it moves much it. more forward. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly is I don't know how fast town council is going to is going to move on this. So we need to be prepared to move very quickly. I have a personal reason for wanting to see us move very quickly. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> December coming. December is coming. Cement <laughs> yeah. your legacy. Uh, I don't know if it's that, but I'd like to at least be part of the process. So uh, I'll work with Jay to see if we can't find the time to get together rather quickly. 
uh, to see if we can workshop this thing. Okay. Any other planning board comments? Okay. Seeing none. Move to adjourn. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And good evening.